Welcome to the next video in the Atrium Cardiology Collaborative Series, Under Pressure, a focus series on hypertension. My name is Stormy Gale. At the time of this recording, I was one of the PGY2 Cardiology Pharmacy residents at the University of Maryland. This video will discuss the basics of resistant hypertension, including definition, prevalence, causes, and treatment. So what exactly is resistant hypertension? There are four criteria that a patient must meet to be considered resistant. First, and most obviously, patient's blood pressures must be elevated above goal. Second, the patient must already be taking three antihypertensive medications. Third, one of these three agents must be a diuretic, preferably in the thiazide class. And lastly, the patient's antihypertensives must be at optimal doses. Patients who are uncontrolled on minimal doses of three different drugs are not considered to be resistant. So why is it important to be able to define resistant hypertension? It is imperative that we can identify this population because there are differences in diagnostic testing and treatment strategies than in non-resistant patients. The prevalence of resistant hypertension is not well understood. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey has been used to estimate the prevalence and has found that the incidence of resistant hypertension has been increasing over time. Before 1994, only 5.5% of all U.S. adults with hypertension were considered to be resistant. From 1999 to 2004 and 2005 to 2008, the rate increased to 8.5 and 11.8% respectively. In 2017, the AHA estimated 13.7% of hypertensive adults to be treatment resistant. This equals out to be almost 12 million adults in the United States currently affected by resistance. There have been several risk factors associated with the diagnosis of resistant hypertension. The older patients are, the more likely that resistant hypertension will be present. In fact, patients greater than 75 years of age are four times more likely to have uncontrolled blood pressure compared with patients 60 years or younger. And although there are several mechanisms attributable to this, it is largely due to increases in arterial stiffness and changes in the body's ability to process sodium as we grow older. Not surprisingly, an elevated baseline blood pressure puts patients at an increased risk for resistant hypertension. This makes sense when we think back to our definition of resistant hypertension, which was a blood pressure above goal despite three agents, one of which being a diuretic, at optimal doses. Patients with higher blood pressures at baseline, understandably, may require more agents to achieve their goals. Lifestyle factors, such as diet and exercise, can also play a role. Obesity increases the incidence of resistant hypertension through changes in hemodynamics, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and metabolic abnormalities. Excessive salt ingestion has been highly associated with resistant hypertension due to the interruption of normal fluid balance in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, although the complete mechanism is suggested to be multifactorial. Chronic kidney disease is one of the greatest known risk factors for resistant hypertension, largely related to the fluid imbalances and impaired sodium excretion that are associated with renal deficiency. The extensive inflammation and atherosclerotic changes associated with diabetes put this population at risk for more difficult to control hypertension as well. Left ventricular hypertrophy is a common echocardiographic finding in patients with hypertension. Left ventricular hypertrophy results in patients with hypertension due to the increased resistance that the left ventricle must overcome to maintain cardiac output. Black patients have a higher incidence of resistant hypertension compared to other races due to an increased incidence of other risk factors in this population, such as obesity, increased salt sensitivity, and lower renin levels, resulting in a decreased effect of agents that target the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Females have also been shown to be at increased risk for resistance compared to men, as blood pressure can be affected by pregnancy and menopause and several secondary causes of hypertension are more prevalent in women. Lastly, patients who reside in the southeastern United States are more likely to be uncontrolled than in other geographic areas, likely as a result of lifestyle factors that contribute to resistance. There are several known causes of resistant hypertension. 
genetic predisposition has been known to play a role, although this area is less well understood than other etiologies of the disease. Medications can also contribute to hypertension, although the extent of this effect varies from patient to patient. Some medications that are known culprits of blood pressure elevations include NSAIDs, certain decongestants, amphetamines, and steroids. Frequently, patients who appear to be highly resistant actually have what is termed pseudo-resistance or fake resistance. In these patients, the blood pressures may appear to be falsely elevated despite optimal medications for a variety of reasons. Some of the most common causes of pseudo-resistance include white coat syndrome, poor blood pressure technique, and non-compliance to medications. It is important to verify that patients are taking their medications appropriately and that recorded blood pressures are accurate before the diagnosis of resistance can be made. Lifestyle factors play a pivotal role in the development of resistant hypertension. You may recall from the previous slide that obesity and excessive salt ingestion are risk factors for this disease, although the relationship between obesity and hypertension is not well understood. Additionally, alcohol intake has been shown to increase the incidence of resistance. Resistant hypertension can also be a result of secondary problems. Common secondary causes of resistant hypertension are obstructive sleep apnea, primary aldosteronism, and kidney problems such as renal parenchymal disease or renal artery stenosis. Additional secondary causes that are less frequent include pheochromocytoma, Cushing's, hyperparathyroidism, aortic coarctations, and intracranial tumors. It is important to understand the causes of resistant hypertension because key treatment strategies may include reversal of the underlying cause prior to the augmentation of antihypertensive regimens. Therefore, the treatment of resistant hypertension follows a different algorithm than in non-resistant hypertension. If a patient is suspected to be resistant, the first step will be to confirm this based on the definition discussed earlier in the video. Is the patient not at goal? Are they already taking three antihypertensives, including a thiazide? Are all of the medications at optimal doses? Part of this confirmation should be to rule out pseudo-resistance. Is the patient compliant with medications? Was the blood pressure reading taken accurately? Non-pharmacologic modification should always be emphasized in this patient population. Patients should be counseled on the importance of maintaining an active lifestyle while avoiding high sodium foods, alcohol, and tobacco. Weight loss should also be addressed. A complete review of patient's medication list should be performed to eliminate possible contributors to resistance. It is important to also ask patients if they use common over-the-counter offenders such as NSAIDs or decongestants, as these will often not be included on prescription lists obtained from the pharmacy or the physician office. As mentioned previously, secondary causes should be explored and reversed whenever possible. However, the details of these will not be discussed in this video. Pharmacologic therapy should be the focus of treatment only after all of these steps have been addressed. In patients with uncontrolled hypertension on three or more agents, including a thiazide diuretic, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists are the agent of choice. As we know, this class inhibits the effect of aldosterone by competing with binding at the renal tubules. Because of the high prevalence of primary aldosteronism in the resistant population, Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist mechanism of action make the class quite effective in these patients. If patients are persistently uncontrolled despite the addition of a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, there are several options that remain, including alpha blockers, centrally acting sympathomimetics such as clonidine and methyl dopa, or direct vasodilators such as hydralazine. Agents should be selected based on patient-specific factors such as compliance, cost, and comorbidities. Thank you for joining us.